In this video, I want to focus on ionic compound nomenclature. We learned, for, we learned that ionic compounds are composed of cations and anions. So first, let's look at the cations. And the basic thing to know about the cations is that we're just going to use the uh, elements name. You can see some examples here. Uh, there's no change in the name. Potassium, magnesium, aluminum. All right. Now, this particular group represents what, what I'm showing in green. All right. These elements that are what I call well behaved. Uh, they don't vary in charge. Uh, for example, sodium's always plus one. Strontium's always plus two. Aluminum is always plus three. And so this little group that I'm highlighting, again, you just simply use the element's name when you're referring to them in a salt formula. The other group you see there, these transition metals here, and also some of these what we call post-transition elements, they have a little bit different look to them. Notice that each one of those can have more than one type of charge. In this table here and the one that's in the book, and countless others, if you Google this topic, uh, you'll see plenty of examples. And the main thing to note here is that when you're dealing with these transition elements, these elements that can vary in charge, we are going to add this little bit of information to the name. Like for example, let's just take one of these. SN, SN is 10. So there's two different 10 cations. There is the 10 plus four cation, and then there is the 10 plus two cation. And like I said, take the Roman numeral, whatever the charge is, and you add it to the name. And that's all. In case you're a little rusty with your Roman numerals, okay, uh, the most common ones you're gonna see, one, two, three, and four, honestly. There's five, you probably won't see it. The first four are the ones you, you see repeatedly. So that's one part of the name for ionic compounds. The second part of the name is gonna deal with these anions. Now for the anions, we do modify their name a bit, okay? So first off, let's just look at, there's actually two different classes here. There's the monoatomic anions and these polyatomics. We'll talk about those in a second. Monoatomic, mono meaning one. Not one charge, but one <laughs> atom or one ion. And it's limited to a fairly small group of elements, right? It's just really that little group of nonmetals there. These three are gonna illustrate the basic pattern Okay, so again, we have this I-D-E ending on the N. We're basically conjugating the name just slightly. And then this portion, the front part of the name for the anion is just coming from the element's name. Instead of iodine, it's iodide. Instead of bromine, it's bromide for the ion. Instead of oxygen, it's oxide. Okay, and let me just... I'm not going to write all these down, but I'll speak them anyway. Nitride, phosphide, oxide, sulfide, fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. And that's it. Okay, Those are the monoatomic anions. The other group, and it's primarily anions. There's a, you know, at least one cation here. But I grouped them all together as a polyatomic ions. The most common ending that we see here is an 8 ending. Occasionally we see I'd. Occasionally we see an ite. So if you see an 8 or an ite, you're definitely dealing with a polyatomic ion. And these are simply molecules that are carrying a negative charge. As an example, let me just draw out um, the structural formula for carbonate, okay? We will not do this officially until um, chapter 10, but I just want to give you a little bit of feel for what this information is trying to get across here. 
Okay, so we have one carbon, three oxygens. They're actually connected together with covalent bonds. Now the reason why they're in this particular category is because they're carrying, well, most of them are carrying negative charges. And just like we've seen before in nature, when something with a negative charge and a positive charge together, come together, they can form a salt. So the thing to be aware of here is that carbonate always has this particular formula, and it always carries a minus two charge. That's, that charge is fixed. Like all of these charges are fixed. Another thing you got to be aware of when you're dealing with the polyatomic ions is that well, you need to be able to recognize them in the formula. Let's go back to that very first slide from the very first video. And look there, there's nitrate sitting there. Okay. And I wrote it out, you know, with the formula that you see on that current slide. Our job is to recognize them and know how to use them for naming salts. Go ahead and pause the video, try these problems, and then restart the video. Okay, so it's asking for the formula between aluminum and phosphate when it forms a compound. Well, from our periodic table trend, from our knowledge of the periodic table, we know aluminum takes on a plus three. From our memory, we know phosphate takes on a minus three, and it has that particular formula, PO4. Yep, it has a three minus. Okay, it's different than what we've seen before. It's new, maybe more complicated, but notice there's a pattern. These charges are equal and opposite. And when we have that pattern, they just simply come together in a one-to-one -one ratio, ALPO4. Now, it's not asking for the name here, but I'm gonna go ahead and name it. Remember what I said about the names. If it's a cation, you're just gonna use the element's name. If it's an anion, then we change the name here if it's monoatomic, it's not, this is phosphate, and we're just going to insert phosphate. So this is simply going to be aluminum phosphate. Formula for this one, same thing, sodium and sulfite. If you look back at the product table, we know sodium takes on a plus one, and we know sulfite is that formula, SO3 with a minus two. So there's sulfate, bisulfate, and sulfite. These charges are not equal and opposite. So what that means, I'm going to use the numerical values here to tell me how much of each one of these I'm going to have in my formula. So the two here is going to tell me I got two sodiums. And then the one here tells me I have one sulfate or sulfite. And again, the reason why we're doing, reason why this what I call the flip-flop rule, the reason why it works, because ultimately we're after this, right? Plus two charge is now gonna cancel out the minus two charge. Now when I name this salt, I still just do what I did here. It's the cation name plus the anion name. So this is just simply sodium sulfite. I have a two here, but that's not stated explicitly in the formula, and that's okay. Because if I was given this formula, well, then what I would have to realize is that, okay, sodium has that form as an ion, and sulfite has that form as an ion. So then you can use, in this case, your flip-flop rule to then figure out what the formula is. So just be aware, we're going to go back and forth. Sometimes you're given the formula and you determine the name. Sometimes you're given the name and you deter you're determining the formula. Again, pause, try it, restart the video. So what I'm looking at here, just a couple of patterns. Um, the metals that I have here, so potassium and zinc. And notice which category they're in. Let's just go to the product table. There's potassium, always takes a plus one. Zinc always takes a plus two. I do not need a Roman numeral. I'm just going to use the name, okay? Because that's what I want to do. I want to name this compound. So I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Potassium, zinc. And then the anion here, bromide and nitride, right? And for the anions, the monoatomic anions, we use those prefix, the IDE prefix. So potassium bromide and zinc nitride. Now, to answer this particular problem, I only needed the names here. So that's really, I did not need this. 
but I went ahead and did this because sometimes you will have to do this, okay? You will have to take a salt formula and break it apart and figure out what the charges are for the different ions before you can name it. For example, here, you'll have to do that. Again, pause the video, try these, and then restart the video. Okay, PBO. Where's PB on the periodic table? It's right there. So it tells me it's going to take on a plus two or a plus four. I don't know which one until I actually start breaking apart this formula. Okay, so let's just, what do I know? I know that one of those two is true. Oxide, it does not vary, right? It always takes on a minus two charge. Okay, so I know this much. And then what is the ratio? The ratio is one to one. That means that the charges are going to be equal and opposite. Therefore, it's not that one. It's this one. It's this pairing up. How do I name those? Well, remember, this is a post-transition metal. If the charges vary, then this is where I'm going to use my Roman numeral. So lead 2, and this is oxide. Just a little side note. If that formula had been... PBO2, that's where, we'll say then, it would have been lead 4 oxide. Why two oxides here? Well, because minus 4 will balance out the plus 4. For this one here, MN, that is manganese, not magnesium. Let's go to the periodic table. Manganese, this is magnesium. Oh, and this, actually, I think it said plus two, plus three. Let's pretend like I don't know, all right? Okay, so manganese and the charge on manganese, uncertain, because again, it's one of those transition metals. Nitrate, though, I know what nitrate is. Nitrate is that. There's a couple ways to approach this. Let me approach it from the charge point of view. If I look at the formula, it tells me I have two nitrates. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that there's a total of minus two charge overall for the anion side. Charges have to charge over here, charge over here, has to be equal and opposite. Therefore, this manganese must be coming in at a plus two charge. And so now I'm going to use my Roman numeral with manganese and nitrate. Notice again, <laughs> there's a two there, but I'm not telling you there's a two here. It's not like I say, you know, nitrate two or dyed nitrate. There's no indication in that with the salt formula. Because again, if you were given this name, you would know nitrate has that formula, manganese would have that formula, and then based on the charges, then you would construct the formula, the empirical formula for the salt. Before I end the video, let me just, there, I said there were two ways to do this. Right? Here I was looking at the charges. Notice you know, I could have done, I could have used my flip-flop rule. Right? I got a two on the outside of that thing. Well, that just happens to correspond to the charge on the cation. And then for the manganese, right, there's a one on the manganese. Well, that tells me what the charge was on the nitrate. More importantly, that two with the plus two then would tell me what Roman numeral I would insert in the name here. Sometimes, when I work these problems, students tell me it looks easy. And then when they try the problem, it's hard. What you need to do is practice these problems. There's questions on mastering chemistry. There's questions in the lab as well that you'll need to do for this section. If you find this confusing, that's okay. Three pieces of advice. Rewatch the video. Maybe read your textbook. And practice some problems. Only by practicing these problems, knowing what you don't understand, and then fixing that knowledge will you become better at naming these compounds. It's basically a foreign language. You're learning a foreign language, and that takes practice. Okay? Thanks.